All right, so we've been looking at the letters of Paul, and so this morning we're supposed to cover all the other letters in the New Testament. And uh, that actually only amounts to, I say only, there's a lot to cover there, but there are only uh, eight uh, of the different uh, scriptures, uh, gospels in the New Testament, letters in the New Testament, that are attributed to anyone other than Paul. So Paul wrote the majority, uh, which it shouldn't surprise us too much, because Paul is the one who did all the missionary journeys all over the place, and as he was going, he of course was laying foundation for churches, and those were the churches then that we see he wrote to uh, during the time uh, that we see he was alive and uh, ministering. And the other letters, uh, just uh, for your interest, John wrote three of them, Peter wrote two, James wrote one, Jude wrote one, and Hebrews, there's debate. Uh, there's debate over who actually wrote Hebrews. Uh, not that it matters all that much, as long as, as we know the Spirit of the Lord leads and guides, and really God is the author of all of the scriptures moving through his people. But uh, this morning, uh, we're going to take a look, starting in 1 John. So I'm sort of going to the end of the lesson, and I'm going to work my way backwards. I tend to do that on occasion. I want to make sure we have the right foundation. Rather than ending up there, let's start there. And we recognize uh, every day that God is our example, and it is from Him that we... Uh, take our instruction, and we watch Him uh, through the Scripture, uh, we keep our eyes on Him through the Word of God, and we take our direction from Him, and He's the one who should then help to help, uh, help us to govern and develop all of our habits and all of our Christ-like characteristics. So no surprise there, uh, we just have to be reminded once in a while to keep our eyes off of flesh and make sure our eyes are, in fact, upon the Lord. So in 1 John, where I am, in chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3. John here wrote an awful lot about God's love. And so we want to just take a look. There's two sections of scripture here. Um, in 1 John, chapter 3, let's begin at verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what, you, what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Then jump to verses 16 to 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. John really uh, sets out for us the answer to a question that perhaps some people might ask. Sometimes uh, you will hear people say, um, well, how do you know that there is a God? And so, what do we do? Well, basically, we try and provide example. Uh, we try and point out things that uh, only God could have done and is still doing. Um, it sort of reminds me of a Bible study I did with some of the, the children in the church, uh, where we kind of look at, as a detective, what are the things that we see around us that we can't really uh, explain in any other way except that there is God. Um, and so those become our examples. And another question that people tend to ask us is, well, 
how do you know God loves you? And how do you, you respond to that? We try and provide an example. Examples are really, really important. Um, they are something that people are constantly looking at and, and observing our lifestyle. We know the Bible speaks of that. Uh, but the examples of what is, um, is sort of the proof in the pudding. It's what uh, people want to see. And so when John writes here in verse 16 that we just read, hereby perceive we the love of God. In other words, here's how we know, here's how we have seen the love of God. See, it's one thing to say that God loves you. But it's a completely different thing, or it's an addition, or an example, or the proof. Well, how do we know that? What has he done to prove that? You know, you can say to somebody, I care for you. You can say to somebody, I love you. Um, you can say all kinds of things. People say all kinds of things. But what did they do? Right? Can they take what they have said and actually demonstrate it? So really what I've chosen to do this morning in looking at the scriptures that we were to uh, examine is to come back and reflect again on this idea of providing evidence of the fact that we are Christians. And God, as I started out, is our great example because God says, I love you. Then he sent his son as a demonstration of his love. Is there any other, is there any greater demonstration? Right? And so when John says that, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So we see the continuation there. God who loved us laid down his life for us in the form of Jesus. And then John doesn't just stop there. He says, he finishes the thought, really, well, if we are to be Christians, which means we are Christ-like, then whatever God has done, then that's something that we should do as well. That's when it starts to get personal. And for some, that's when it starts to get tough. Easy to say, but now you want me to actually do something? Well, wait a minute. Now you're pushing this to a whole different level. You know, I can say, oh yeah, I'm going to change my life, but now you actually want me to change something that I'm doing, something that I've done for years and years and years, perhaps my entire life, some habit that I have. Yes, easy to say, but now put it into action. See, John and the early church, they really nailed people to the wall in a sense that there wasn't any wiggle room, right? The facts were the facts as God gave them. And people either accepted them or rejected them. There wasn't this kind of wishy-washy in between. There wasn't this, well, we'll compromise for you and we'll compromise for you. There were attempts at that. And we know that Paul in particular wrote a lot to the churches about being aware, being very, very careful that that doesn't creep in. So we need to be careful too, on an individual level, and certainly on a church congregational family level, we have to be careful about not letting worldly things creep in, but we also need to be very careful not to be Christians in word only. And that becomes the tricky piece, that becomes the challenge, okay? Sometimes, you see, and we're going to get into the looking at faith a little bit, uh, and, you know, the faith without works is dead sort of concept once again, which we hear a lot, but we really have to examine. Because, you know, when we look at the Word of God, it requires a balance. And so you can't say just because some people use their works and use that and say that that is their salvation, you can't stop then and say, well, we're not going to do any works. Okay? What we have to do is pray for those people that have gotten off track. And then we have to pray for ourselves and ask God to help us to stay on track. All right? So when it says here then in verse 18, and 
19, right, when it speaks then, uh, as he goes on here, or in back actually to verse 17, but whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Great question, right? It's pretty straightforward. But boy, I can just see the people in a church squirming on that one. Right? Because again, through John, God really puts his finger on those that claim to be Christians. See, a little while back, I preached about how God and Jesus, through example, was most concerned with people. His whole ministry was about people. His ministry was not about economics. His ministry wasn't about any of those things. His ministry was completely focused on the well-being of the people. He also, though, recognized, and this is where the balance comes in, that in order for the people to be well, not only most important, number one, that they have to be spiritually taken care of, but they also needed to be physically and naturally taken care of. That's why the Bible speaks about God's blessing, right? That God knows what we have need of. He will take care of us. He'll provide shelter. He'll provide food. He'll provide all of these things that we need that help to sustain this natural form that we have and helps us to then do the spiritual work that God is asking every one of us to do. But as it's put here, those that have much, I'm paraphrasing, but have the worldly goods, that would be the material things, right? Those that have the material things, but then you see somebody who doesn't have, and you show no compassion on that brother, what kind of demonstration of love is that? That's when it starts to get tough. Now, the other excuse that sometimes jumps into my mind, I'll be very honest with you, is what I believe Satan puts in there, and we have to rebuke him, when somebody comes along, or our mind comes along and says, yeah, but what can I do? I'm, I'm just one person. Like, how can I make any kind of a difference? Well, what we have to recognize is even a small, incremental, very tiny, tiny thing that I might be able to do, and you might be able to do, does make a difference. Right? Because, and I'm going to preach on this this evening, God puts everything in the blender and puts it all together for His honor and for His glory and for His good. Every little part that goes in the blender is critical, is important to the final outcome. And so when we look around and we see people in need, so we have to bring it now to the reality, right? to the reality of the situations that we have. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's because, we, let's not get into, well, pointing fingers, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of this other thing. Let's just deal with the reality, okay? The reality, at least as I see it right now, is there are a lot of people in the world that are suffering. Now that's a really big blanket statement, right? So many that it's absolutely overwhelming. Do you listen to any news? Do you watch any news? Right? And, and you can go beyond. We have to remember that, sure, this virus thing, that's one thing that's happening. That doesn't mean everything else has stopped happening. Right? We still have wars going on. Right now in Ethiopia, big problems. Right? And, and sort of a... a one section of Ethiopia that's developed their own government and sort of a, almost a breakaway and the main part of Ethiopia. And, you know, so there are thousands of people, refugees, going over the river, through the river, and so that's the border, right, between Ethiopia and Sudan. Thousands going with nothing but the clothes they have on their backs. We can't forget about that. We heard a brother Harris when he came in and he spoke to Pastor John and myself about his sister in Jamaica. Right? The rain, and I'm sure this is striking all of that area down there, you know, the rain, the rain, the rain. According to what Brother Harris was saying, 
his sister and the people around where he they live, they barely get out of the house because of the rain. The weather is so terrible. Flooding, he said, every house has water in it. Right? And because of the mud and the, you know, the sort of the, the situation that's going on there, he explained not just mudslides, but actually houses are being swallowed up. The earth is opening up, it's just turning into this mush, and the houses, the houses are just disappearing. Okay? That's still happening today. It has absolutely nothing to do with the virus. The virus, of course, has come on top of all of these other things, all of the other sicknesses, all the other diseases, right? The cholera that's still in Africa, I heard they, they hopefully just managed to eradicate in another area. All these things that are out there, all I'm trying to say and emphasize is there is obvious need everywhere. And I haven't even started to talk about our own neighborhood or your own neighborhood. I get the email from the food bank, right? And whether you think food banks are necessary or not, we have people that are hungry, okay? And so they're looking for turkeys and hams and cash, right? They're looking to help support. On the news, I saw thousands of people in the States, not in some third world, you know, what you might consider undeveloped sort of nation, Thousands of people in the United States of America, our southern neighbor, lining up for food boxes. Right? Around, you know, they're lining up overnight to get the food that's coming. Some of them still working, but their hours have been cut. And imagine what would happen, well, and some of you maybe it's experiencing that, right? Your hours are cut, your job suddenly goes from this to this. How do you make ends meet? How, do you, how, do you, how does that happen? Right? So everywhere around us, including in Canada, we have great need. And so this idea of praying for that is absolutely critical. But faith without works is dead. That's what the Bible says. And that's what God shows us when he sends his son to die on a cross, an example, right, is love in action, demonstrating that. And now John is saying, as God's people, shouldn't we be doing the same thing? In some way, somehow, helping. Now, you know, does God expect me or you to write a check that's going to solve every problem everywhere? No. That's foolish. But what I do believe is that God knows what I'm capable of giving. God knows what you're capable of giving. God knows when it's a sacrifice, and God knows when it's just, oh, I've got a couple extra bucks and I don't need it, so I'm just going to give it. There's differences there, right? And it doesn't really matter what anybody else sees. For me and for you, I pray, the most important thing is what does God know? What does God see? I was, um, as I was studying for the lesson, um, very fittingly, um, happened to see a Facebook posting by Glenda. And perhaps some of you saw it as well. What were they doing? Loading candies and toys into her truck. Okay? So that they could give that to people in the villages and the children and all of those kind of things. Unbelievable. She's got a pretty big vehicle, right? And they had boxes and boxes and boxes that they were trying to fit into the back of her vehicle. And then there's a picture of her sitting there and the whole thing is packed from right up to the ceiling all the way back. Right? She's got an SUV sort of truck thing. And uh, it's packed full of candies and toys. Now some might look at that and say, oh, well, shouldn't she be spending more time praying? Shouldn't she be spending more time reading the Bible? Shouldn't she be spending more time preaching the Word? She spent all that time, a whole day, loading up her truck and then driving and delivering. Well, that's faith put into action. That's God's love being demonstrated to the people that have need. 
And see, that takes time too. But God sees that. And as long, I, as I look at scripture, as long as there's a balance, as long as we don't forget the prayer and the fasting and the studying of the scripture and the magnifying the Lord and all of those things and praising Him, as long as we don't forget that, then there is a place for time to be spent demonstrating God's love by distributing and giving out whatever it happens to be, blankets and clothing. You know, she took all kinds of clothing that had it all shipped there into Mexico and all those things. And so she's a very good example right now, I feel, on top of the Bible school and all those other things that are happening down there, is they are also trying to meet needs or bring some small pleasure, some comfort, I guess you could say to people that don't have an awful lot. And so spiritually, you know, this is what John was saying here, um, you know, when he says, my little children, in verse 18, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. The demonstration of love is extremely, extremely important. If we go now to uh, John chapter 15, not 1st John or 2nd John, just John. This is actually not, I believe, a verse in our lesson for today in the study text. But it's one that I wanted to make sure I included here. In John chapter 15, a short little verse, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And I have to read that verse because, again, fruit is an example. Okay? How do you tell what kind of tree? For most of us, unless we're, you know, I, I took some courses in university. Um, when I was doing my planning studies, we had to um, learn a little bit about plants because part of what a planner is supposed to do is help coordinate some of that. Anyway, to identify trees and things, right? So you can identify a tree by bark and, uh, you know, different colors and, and how the branches are. So you could identify a tree in the winter when there are no leaves and, of course, by the leaves. Then another way to identify a tree is by its fruit. And, and so all of these things become example or gifts in a sense. You know, when a tree provides an apple, yes, it is to help that tree multiply, right? Because we know there are seeds in there. But it's also really a gift to everybody who partakes of it. And so as Christians, here in John chapter 15, we glorify the Father. That's really critical, right? Herein is my Father glorified. So when, whether you're the one doing it, or I'm the one doing it, or somebody else is doing it, that really doesn't matter at all. The fact is it's being done, and it's being done for the honor and glory of the Father. All of these... Uh, and of course in the states it's Thanksgiving hampers that they're giving out right now, right? Turkeys and potatoes. I heard a guy who was talking, oh this box has got a turkey in it, some of them have ham in them, then there's potatoes and they have squash and vegetables and then watermelon. I thought that was an interesting addition. And then you know, different things in these boxes. And they were giving out, like I said, you know, like in one spot there were well over a thousand that they gave out in one day. You think those boxes just get put together all by themselves? Obviously not, right? There are all kinds of people working behind the scenes. And those people, they're, I trust, some of them maybe, but most, they're not in it for their own glory. They're not in it so that they can be on some news channel and be interviewed or something like that. They're doing it to help the people. Okay? And as God's people, whatever we do is to glorify the Father. 
It's to proclaim. God loves you. God cares for you. God will help provide for you. Here, here's something that we can do. Uh, I'm going to use Steph as a little bit of an example, too. Um, she's pretty good at, uh, you know, when you see people that are at the stop signs and things, they got their little sign and they're looking for some change or whatever it happens to be. And sometimes it's really easy to be judgmental, right? We can look at them and sometimes, you know, we look the other way, we don't want them to come to our window or whatever it happens to be. Well, Steph's pretty good at giving out granola bars and little, you know, whatever, fruit cups or anything like that. And then I made up some stickers, you know, that say Bethel Tabernacle and phone number and address and whatever. So whether they read it or not, who knows, right? But the point is, right, you put down the window, here, you hungry? Have a granola bar, have a fruit cup, have whatever, all right? And then if they happen to read, you know, oh, where's this coming from? It's another way to testify. It's another way to say, hey, we're part of God's army, and we're working to give God honor and glory and praise. And you can be part of the army too. That's always the most important part of the message that we want to convey. So bearing fruit, and I, I look at that, and then we have to examine ourselves. I look at that and I look at myself. How much fruit did I actually bear this week? Or maybe it's too hard for me to remember a whole week. What about today? At the end of the day, when you sit down and you're getting ready to put your head on a nice pillow and cover yourself up with a blanket and you're inside a nice warm place after what we see what's going on outside today, would you like to live on the street? Would you like to be, you know, in a shelter somewhere? Personally, no way. And then, you know, and then I say, thank you, Lord, for the blessing that you've given to me. But not everybody is so blessed. Part of that is their own fault. Okay, I'm not going to deny that. But God changes things. That's something we have to remember, right? It's not my job to look at somebody who's in trouble and list all the reasons why they're in trouble. God knows the reasons. My task is to offer them a way out of trouble. And what is the way? Jesus is the way. God is the way. You know? I maybe didn't, I maybe wasn't living on the street, and, you know, I wasn't somebody injecting myself with, with drugs or anything of that nature, but I needed a savior. I needed God. And in that sense, I was as much in trouble as that person who's living on the street or doing whatever. Okay? And the beauty of the Lord's love when he sent his son was that that was for all that will believe. It was for anybody who will say, I want to give my heart to the Lord. Because God can change anyone and make any situation a better situation for his honor and glory. And, you know, if you don't believe that or you have trouble remembering that, we always point at Paul, right? Or Saul. We always point at, I always look at him. And I think, man, here's somebody who is so involved, sincerely, but so involved, I believe, in going the wrong way, persecuting Christians and hunting them down and chasing them from their homes and, and all of these different things. And God picked him. Why would God pick him? Well, it's the same reason that God could pick somebody up from the road or up from a shelter or up from addiction or whatever it happens to be. It's the same reason God can pick them up and use them for his honor and his glory. And see, God wants us to have at least we have the opportunity to have a small part in helping that to happen. Because God has chosen for his children to be the ones that put their Christianity into action, that put their faith into action, just like God put his love into action by sending Jesus for me and for you. Turn with me just quickly to James chapter 2.
This is, of course, uh, for us, familiar scripture. But what I never want this to be is a section of scripture that an unsaved person points to and looks at me or looks at you or looks at God's church and says, wait a minute, this doesn't line up. This doesn't fit. Okay? So when it says here in James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And if you don't have that underlined, or don't have that particularly memorized, that's so critical. Right? He's not saying that faith is works, or that works is faith. He's saying that he will show thee the faith by. That little word by is really important. It's the example again. Okay? It's the example. And we don't get faith by our works, but when we have faith in God, then it's it should be something that has to come out somehow, right? It's kind of like when you're happy, your body wants to demonstrate it. Or if you're sad, your body wants to demonstrate it, right? And if we see tears, and we all become familiar with the sound of crying, and we all cry a little bit differently, right? That tells us something is going on. The example, the demonstration, is linked to something that's going on inside. When my mind is in turmoil, I might be sad. That is demonstrated in many different things. When I'm full of joy, that's demonstrated. Likewise, when I am full of God, when I am a Christian, when I'm happy because the Lord has saved me, when I've got the joy of the Lord as my strength, guess what? It should also be demonstrated. All right? And so we have to let that happen and let the world see what we've got inside that comes out. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. And then this is always a hit it right on sort of sentence. The devils also believe and tremble. See, there's no difference. Believing, that's great. But how is it demonstrated? But wilt thou know, a vain, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him by for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and need and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. In the bulletin today, and I don't know, perhaps Pastor John will extend this, we'll see. It says, we'll be taking a special offering this morning for Sister Bernice Harris to assist her in her work in Jamaica. The country's been devastated by many storms, washed away many homes and families. We can read it. I just did. We should pray about it, absolutely. We should keep her in our prayers each and every day. But those things, by themselves, what's that going to do directly? Okay. I mean, when we look at the scripture, right? 
it's not necessarily feasible for all of us to get on a plane and fly down to Jamaica and start helping with tents and rebuilding houses or, or anything like that. That's not feasible yet. That doesn't mean we should do nothing. Okay. And then you might say, well, wait a minute, uh, you know, I'm going through my own hard time. That, that could very well be true. And then we have to do a little bit of a scale kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. What does your hard time mean compared to what it means in some other place, right? You know, I might say, oh, wait a minute, you know, the budget's getting really tight. I'm going to have to give up some of the channels on my television. Is that a hard time? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I might have to get rid of one of my cars. Ooh, one of them? You still have another one. Do you understand what I'm trying to say, right? Like, you know, you know, when you go through and you look at what is a sacrifice for us and then you consider well, if I come out of church today and my house has been swallowed up in the ground by mud, um, how does that compare, right? That's going to be a problem, right? Giving up a few TV channels or selling them, having to give them all up, whatever. Those are not things that are really a sacrifice. Those are all extras, okay? And what the Lord is saying, we, as God's people, need to, I believe what he's saying to me anyway, be a better demonstration of God's love. And this, to me, and I close on this, really links everything back together. You know how I had said at one point, we need to let people know that we're here. We need to let people know we're here. And I'm not just talking about Bethel Tabernacle, although that's certainly on my mind. But I'm talking now in general as well. We need to let people know that Christians are still here. And it's sometimes, this is my, it's baffling to me how sometimes we find that so difficult to do. Maybe it's just me. Right? But, uh, you know, I'm, I very frequently take, a, you know, will say to Steph or somebody else, you know, when somebody's wearing a shirt that's got some demonic symbols on it, or you know, they've got them tattooed on their skin, or they will carry a sign, you know, that says very clearly they're anti-religion, anti-Christian, um, anti-babies, uh, you, you know, you name it, right? They have absolutely no problem advertising and letting the world know they're here. So what... God is saying is let the world know that you're still here. That God is still here. And through it all, though it may seem very improbable to us, God has a way of reaching out and touching people. And it often starts with the kindness and the love that we can show to somebody that will help to build a relationship of some sort that then we can take opportunity to show them hey, this isn't really just me that's giving you this or showing you this kindness it's because God first loved me and now he's saying you go out and you love others so when we look at the letters, the other letters in the, in the New Testament obviously there is so very very much there for us to cover but take a look at that pray about that um, and, and you know and again then when we pray let's not be too surprised when the Lord opens a door because then what God is saying and so here it is again you prayed about it you said you wanted this something to happen now God says, okay, there's the door. I'm opening it up for you. Something's happening. Guess what? God now says, now you need to move through the door. You need to pick up the phone. You need to go to that volunteer thing. You need to go to that uh, breakfast program. You need to go to whatever it happens to be, and you need to help. All right? Not just say it, but actually do it. May the Lord bless you.